Hi, and welcome to the Trading Belt Show. Now, agriculture is the primary economic sector in the country, and I'll be speaking about matters agriculture with Faisal Farid, the CEO of Magzim Agri and Samakgro. Now, they have set up in Kenya and are doing great and are already market leaders when it comes to matters feeds. Faisal, welcome to the show. Nice to meet you, Maina. Great, and it's good to have you. I would like us to introduce Magzim first to the viewers and what you're doing in Kenya. But first, what is your core mandate? We are an agri company. We are a one window company for a variety of products. Yeah. So that's what distinguishes us from any other agri company. We are into uh, multiple species feed. Mm -hmm. We produce fish feed, we produce cattle feed, we are going to get into poultry. Yeah. But then we are also into micro fertilizers. Um, bovine semen, um, uh, equipment, mm -hmm. seeds. Um, so it's a full range and um, we believe that the farmer can have majority of his needs fulfilled from just one company, one yeah. reliable company. Mm -hmm. um, many of these products are not there in Kenya today. Yeah. Uh, we are going to bring them over time. Okay. But we are starting off with um, fish feed, mm -hmm. which we have already started, yeah. and uh, dairy and poultry, which we will start in a few weeks time. Okay, great. Let's talk about your interest in expanding your operations into Kenya. And, and before that, there's a time I had a conversation with, uh, you know, some people in the agricultural sector. And one of the key things they were talking about is the cost and how expensive it is, especially to get feed. And I'm happy that you get into the field yourself. First of all, let's talk about the interest in Kenya and what you've seen so far. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Um, Kenya, we believe, is a very exciting opportunity. Mm -hmm. But let me just give you some figures and um, maybe put our context yeah. of those figures. Sure. So everybody that we meet here says 75% um, of the people in Kenya are employed directly or indirectly by agriculture. Yeah. That's a very large dependence on agriculture. Mm -hmm. But let's look at what it contributes to the GDP. Mm -hmm. It only contributes 25%. Yeah. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. 75% of the people yeah. contributing only 25% of GDP. Yeah. That means it's a highly unproductive sector. Okay. So either agriculture has to contribute 70% or you have to employ less people okay. in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And that's something not to be very proud of that 75% people are engaged in agriculture, only yeah. giving 25%. Absolutely. So what is needed? Mm -hmm. What is needed is we make the sector a lot more productive. Yeah. The soil should give more, the cows should give more, the fish should grow quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the only way to grow the productivity of the sector, Absolutely. along with the management practices, which I think are also critical. Yeah. That's where we come in. Okay. Our products, we believe, are far, far superior than our competition. Mm -hmm. That's the opportunity that we saw. We saw a gap in the market. Yeah. We saw people were not getting and the farmers were not getting what they deserve. Mm -hmm. um, and also in many cases, they were being overcharged. Mm -hmm. So we believe we can make the money the right way by offering good value for money, but giving a quality to the Kenyan farmer that they've never seen before. And um, <clears throat> you know, we started fish operations just about a few weeks ago. And I can safely say in um, eight weeks' time, we've probably gotten 60% share of the fish feed uh, business. Wow. What does that tell you? Mm -hmm. That there was a gap. There was a gap. Yeah. You're right. So we're very excited. Okay. Um, there are challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, no country and no business opportunities without challenges. Yeah. Uh, but that's what uh, our role is. If You're there right. were no challenges, I think AI can do it better. <laughs> okay, Faisal. I think let's just keep on on that. And I loved how we have started it over. Um, I love the fact that you say that you have the superior quality and that's why you've seen the 60% growth, which is quite impressive. How long have you been around? How long have you produced for you to now even have the 60% market? Yeah, so I think we, we, um, we have only been there for eight weeks. Wow. Um, but eight, we, weeks eight weeks and you have 60% yeah. market share now. Now, we <laughs> did have a couple of advantages. Okay. Um, the, one of the largest fish farms in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, which is Victory Farm, yeah. led by uh, Joe Remen, yeah. uh, is one of our joint venture partners. Yeah. Uh, and obviously they are a large customer of ours as well. Mm -hmm. But it's not just um, Victory Farms. Mm -hmm. um, out of the other eight farms in East Africa, which are large farms, mm -hmm. I think 70% or you know, seven out of six out of eight mm -hmm. uh, have started buying from us yeah. uh, within the first eight weeks. Wow. Um, 
So what does, you know, so that's a testimony of the quality. So it's not me talking about our superior quality. Okay. It is the feedback that we are getting from the customers in the form of them actually purchasing yeah. and buying from us and shifting from other suppliers to us in a very short period of time, which speaks for the quality that we are giving. Excellent. And the prices that we are giving. Great. You are <laughs> emphasizing on producing feed without hormones, aflatoxins, and antibiotics. Mm -hmm which is quite an interesting angle because there has been also conversations about we should be careful to know what we are eating. And this is good, this is good progress. Could you elaborate on the significance of this approach in enhancing agricultural sustainability and achieving maximum yields? Yeah, so um, I think it's still very new yeah. and I hope that over the period of time these conversations will be louder yeah. and more people will be interested because these are very significant um, topics to talk about, especially yeah. for a developing country like Kenya or other developing countries where the health resources are less. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you uh, load the health system with too much um, illnesses because of the ingredients that you're eating, yeah. then obviously that's not a desirable situation. So let me go one by one. Yeah. Um, first of all, hormones. Mm -hmm. If you put hormones, the reproductive system of the animal gets affected. It will mm -hmm. give you quick yields. Mm -hmm high yields, yeah. but then the animal will not be conceived very quickly, mm -hmm. which means the farmer is getting high milk yeah. for the days that he's producing, yeah. but instead of a three month calving period, mm -hmm. he may have a six month or a year calving period. Mm. And he will only learn when that time comes. Yeah. Um, and in absence of any better choices, yeah. he did not know what to do. Sure. So that's hormones. Okay. Uh, aflatoxin um, can be carcinogenic and um, they are transferred from milk and meat, mm. uh, from sorry, feed to the animal and from animal to the end products, which is milk and meat, yeah. which the consumers eat. Mm -hmm. So you don't even know, so when you people say pure milk, mm -hmm. <coughs> what does pure milk mean? Pure milk means that has not been adulterated, but that's yeah. not where it ends. <laughs> uh, people have to look at what their cows were being fed. You're right. And right now, there's only one company mm -hmm. that is testing, as far as I understand, yeah. is testing every single batch of milk that they're buying, which is biofoods. Very true. Uh, yeah. I've had and a conversation with Joachim as well. Yeah. Yeah. So they are also our partners in mm -hmm. this business. Great. Um, and they're paying for quality. Mm -hmm. And uh, But you know, our uh, relationship is not just going to be with bio. Yeah. We want to engage with every single stakeholder, every single dairy processor mm -hmm. to raise this awareness and get better quality milk to the consumers. The last one yeah. was antibiotics. Mm. So what do antibiotics do? If you keep feeding your animals antibiotics, yeah. they will still give more milk, mm -hmm. but then the, they get um, resistant to antibiotics, both the animals as well as the end consumer. Oh no. So all these three have mm -hmm. significant impact on the society, on the consumers, and while the conversations have started, mm -hmm. they are not as loud as they should be. Yeah. So part of our role is going to be creating this awareness, mm -hmm. meeting with the stakeholders, including mm -hmm. the government, mm -hmm. but much more importantly than the government is the private stakeholders, mm -hmm. all the milk processors and raising awareness that this is something that we need to do mm -hmm. um, for the health of our consumers. Wow. I'm curious, from a customer's perspective, we consume a lot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the last question you want to ask yourself is, uh, what am I consuming? But over the time, people are beginning to ask the question of where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. In fact, speaking to Kakuzi CEO, they said the customer right now wants to do tracing of how these things were done, how things were, uh, were planted, where the sources came from. And you're right that, yes, we have to be careful on this. But I have a question for you. I know you have not been here for long, but I'll ask mm -hmm. you. You have done your market research and you have seen it all. How entrenched is this in some of you, you may not name names, but the current ones that have been there before you even came forth, are they using this type of things? Um, so each one of this is a complex issue. Yes. Uh, there are no easy answers. Okay. Um, you have to change and fundamentally revolutionize the supply chain. Yeah. Um, and uh, so for instance, a majority of the aflatoxin comes from maize. Mm. Um, if you're not growing enough homegrown maize, yeah. and you have to rely on imports, mm. the longer the life between 
the growing of the maize and harvesting to the actual usage, yeah. the higher the chances of aflatoxin. Ah, I see that. So when you import from other places, mm. they are full of aflatoxin. Okay. Um, uh, similarly, because of you know competition, some companies are, um, I guess, um, vulnerable to using hormones or okay. antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, we believe that it can be done without all of those. Um, it's going to be tough. Yeah. It's not easy. Um, every single day we reject batches. Yeah. Even in the first eight weeks, I cannot tell you how many trucks have we sent back from the factory, mm -hmm. um, which were did not pass our aflatoxin test. Wow. Uh, I'm not sure if many other companies would do that. Okay. Now, what does that do? Mm -hmm. That raises the price for us because people know that this company is going to reject. Yeah. So in the future shipment, they build in the price. Mm -hmm. But we believe that if you are giving the right product, yeah. people are willing to pay yeah. as long as they have the confidence that you are not going to do any of those things. Wow. Um, but it's going to take time. I yeah. think the conversations, as you said, and the awareness and the transparency is still in mm -hmm. a very small part of the society. Mm -hmm. um, once they become more widespread, yeah go from the intelligentsia to the common person, mm -hmm. I think that's when the manufacturers will be under greater pressure uh, to fix the whole supply chain. Okay. For the sake of context, you are in Kenya. Which other countries are you serving? Um, so we started off from Pakistan yeah. uh, back in 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in Sri Lanka yeah. and now we are in Kenya. Mm -hmm. But we have aims beyond Kenya and to explore the rest of the continent as well. Okay. Let's talk about the regulatory perspective and how the government of the day can help you because I am sure in your plant already, you have created employment, you're helping up and it has a ripple effect to the economy as well. What can the government who as well are watching, most of them watch this program, uh, what can they do to support you know, people like you so that at least we have you know, even better ways of growth, uh, because in the end effect, it's purely growing us. Mm -hmm. So let me just take it into a different context. Yeah. Um, I think there is a widespread um, awareness that Africa doesn't need aid, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it needs business, it needs investments, it needs trade. The president is very vocal on that, yeah. yes. Uh, similarly, I think we don't need government's help. Mm -hmm. The more the government tries to help, yes. <laughs> um, the more difficult it becomes for the business. Ah. So if you let the businesses grow, do, do less of subsidies because subsidies are political. Yeah. Right. And we don't want subsidies. We don't want too much. Uh, there should be a regulatory framework, which should be the same for everyone. Mm -hmm. They should update their standards to what is good for the Kenyan consumers yeah. and hold people accountable. Yeah. and create a level playing field. Mm -hmm. If they can do their regulatory work right, I think that's 90% of the task. Mm. But if the government, you know, in every developing country, the government has this urge to help a sector. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen that sector develop with a lot of government's help. Okay. <laughs> that's an interesting perspective. Are you not afraid, afraid of this? One, some of your competition, and I'm glad that you've already, mm -hmm. you know, grown very fast in eight weeks. Some of your competition may probably not be careful enough to look at, you know, do we have a aflatoxin here, the antibiotics, the oil? And I mean, just ethical business practice. Are you not afraid of the fact that they will still control some significant market share because uh, of the scalability that they have because they're using these particular items versus you who is strictly trying to observe as much as you can this super quality? Are you not worried of the fact that your margins might as well not make sense? Um, so first of all, I think just in terms of the scale, so while we may be the newest um, kid on the block, yeah, uh, but we have the largest uh, fish feed mill in Kenya. Okay. So in terms of scale, mm -hmm. um, and we have already, and probably hopefully less than a year, we'll run out of that capacity of that largest yes. fish feed mill. Yeah. So we don't have a disadvantage of scale. Mm -hmm. um, I think for many of our competitors, this is a side business. You know, they have other main businesses yeah. and feed and this is not their core business. Mm -hmm. 
for us this is our bread and butter okay and when something is your bread and butter mm -hmm. um i think you are very passionate about it yeah and it does not just come with um with a business goal it comes with a lot of passion yeah um it will be very difficult for our competitors to match our passion wow so we'll we'll make money uh -huh. um we'll make money the right way yes and hopefully we hope to act as a catalyst mm -hmm. you know because we believe everybody if everybody does it the right way yeah uh, the industry will grow we'll grow the industry will grow they have a lot of space it's a huge market okay uh, we don't have to fight for share we can all grow the market together and grow it the right way you're right and this cuts across we've talked a lot about the the fish industry and you've told me you're also moving to the dairy right yeah how can i I'm a customer like in or some of our viewers how can i differentiate sometimes you know uh at least i know what we call here locally kenyeji you know those kind of uh, locally bred without any kind of feed because sometimes we are afraid of some of the chicken we are taking you taste it you wonder what are you eating you know how can you differentiate some of these products so that at least we are able to trace i have seen for example some of the factories have started saying this is where it was grown all those kind of things so that you able to follow how can we know that this at least has been grown uh with maxims products mm -hmm. mine that's a great question and i think that brings us to uh um, the labeling issue yeah so you know not dictated by the government yeah but if the companies believe that the consumers are asking for it yeah they'll be forced to put labeling on aflatoxin free or aflatoxin this level mm -hmm. and that's what we are working towards mm -hmm. um that it becomes a marketing advantage at yeah, first right. and then becomes an industry standard mm -hmm. that no milk or chicken could be produced without this label and if mm -hmm. some companies start doing it mm -hmm. others will be forced to yeah and it will also become easier for the government to then regulate and check the aflatoxin level at the end product yeah not in the intermediary product mm. um so if you start testing it at the end product yeah then the supply chain will get fixed and we'll play our role yes. we'll play our role with our technology our innovation our knowledge yeah and our intent mm -hmm. and we hope that we'll bring a positive change yeah i'm sure starting up in kenya we have had different testimonies of people and some of the challenges they face in that and i'm sure you have your share as well of your challenges which i wanted to share for you and you know in a way advice entrepreneurs who probably would be saying i want to go to kenya and set up there mm -hmm. uh what else you experience what are the challenges that you're facing in the process so um as an entrepreneur i believe the opportunities are in places where there are more challenges oh so if you go to more developed easy places mm -hmm. you may not find gaps yeah So if you go to Europe there will be no aflatoxin issue there will be no <laughs> issue there will be ten other companies doing very yeah. very well. Yeah. Um so you have to take risks. Mm -hmm. You have to be prepared to deal with those challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where the reward is. Um growing population, yeah. rising income levels, mm -hmm. growing awareness on a journey to transform itself. Yeah. Um and not enough suppliers who are willing to meet the challenges of the future. Mm -hmm. So um we had our share of challenges from um um people backing out of the land deals yes to lots of uh, financiers <laughs> saying no to us uh -huh. uh, in the beginning they thought that we I don't know you know the project costs a lot more than what we are asking for mm -hmm. um and we were asking for a lot less because yeah. we could do the project in a lot less money and capital yeah. so making people believe that we are we know what we are saying mm -hmm. all took a lot of uh, time and effort yeah so the advice to the entrepreneurs i think there is uh, two or three things one is um resilience yeah uh no entrepreneur becomes a successful entrepreneur unless he has the patience and the resilience and the perseverance wow so If you don't have the perseverance then this is not for you. This you know then you do a 9 to 5 job. <laughs> the second is yeah um don't count the hours. Yeah. So, you know this is not for people who want work life balance. Mhm. Mm uh which is the most common uh slogan these days work life balance. Yeah, it it may work for 80% of the people. Yeah. But those 20% who are going to rise you know somebody is putting in 16 hours a day he will have far more learning in lesser period of time than somebody who's putting in 8 hours of absolutely time. 
Yeah. So you can't compare the two. And um, um, we believe you need to work hard, yeah. uh, put in all those hours and have a lot of patience mm -hmm. and believe in your dream. Mm -hmm. You know, what others cannot see yeah. and the youth can see, yeah. that's what one day the others will start seeing. You're but right. then it'll be too late for others. Mm -hmm. You'll already be ahead of the game. Wow. <laughs> As we come to the tail end of the conversation, corporates and even, uh, I mean, looking at the listed companies as well under ESG guidelines, under the NSC, I mean, and corporates being advised, and this is the current conversation we're having, that we need to be mindful of what we're doing to the environment and socially ensuring that we are coexisting well <clears throat> and within our organizations have proper governance. I'd like to speak on that uh, from Maxim's perspective. How are you relating with to ensure that you are not part of the people who are also contributing to a lot of production? Because your industry has been accused sometimes mm -hmm. of being some of the greatest emitters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I know you have persons that you've put together and are working in your company now. How many are they, by the way? So please speak on that. Yeah, so um, another very relevant question. And yeah. let me just talk about the climate from a different context. So. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure whether you know or not know, but every single cow emits 100 liters of methane every day. Um, they contribute to 15% per of the world greenhouse gases mm -hmm. globally. Yeah. In Kenya, I'm sure it's higher as a percentage of mm -hmm. emissions. Yeah. Um, you have a 20 million population of cows mm -hmm. emitting methane every single day. Yeah and they are the lowest producing cows in the world. Mm -hmm. So they only produce about 1,200 liters a oh. year mm -hmm. uh, compared to um, US, which is 12,000 or other European 8,000. So it's like one tenth, one eighth. Yeah. What does it mean? It means uh, you have 10 times more cows mm -hmm. than what you actually need. Yeah producing methane emissions every single day far greater than any industry, mm. right? Now, where do we come in? It's about having less cows, but a lot more productive cows. Okay. If you have the same cow producing three or four times, you don't need 10 million cows. That's Unless true. you are into exports. Yeah. So you can cut on your methane emission mm -hmm. by using our feed, making our cows more productive, using yeah. our bovine semen, improving your genetics yeah. um, and all of that. Yeah. So um, I think I'm, I'm just giving you a broader context, context of right. sustainability mm -hmm. and of environment. Yeah. Uh, yes, the other thing, the kind of energy that we use, um, we are working on uh, with other partners to see if we can um, develop geothermal energy and, for, and move away from fossil fuels. That mm -hmm. was our initial um, um, desire but then uh, somebody who promised us um, a geothermal backed out of the deal at yeah. the last minute and we had to go to uh, KPLC. Mm -hmm. But we haven't lost that cause. I think we are going to go back into environment friendly uh, energy sources. Yeah. Um, and on the product itself, we are researching different kinds of um, raw materials and ingredients which reduce methane like um, mm -hmm. seaweed. So seaweed reduces methane emission in a cow dramatically. Yeah. Uh, but how do we make it commercially available? And with the last coastline, I think in Kenya it can be done. Mm -hmm. um, that's a project for the midterm. Yeah. Uh, but immediately our desire is to make cows more productive, have less cows, giving more milk, mm -hmm. uh, less stress on the soil, less stress on the water in Kenya, less stress on the methane emission. That's where we come in. I know I said we are almost ending, but I have to ask this question. Uh, one of it is on funding and uh, whether you would consider, because this is the Trading Belt show and we really talk to a lot of listed companies, whether you would consider to list, that would be one of the questions. But back to uh, the question on ESG, I just wanted to know, you creating employment and how many are they and what is the future like for Maxim? Mm -hmm. It would be nice to know as well as we come to a close. So. Um I think we have already created about 100 direct jobs wow. um, and about 500 indirect jobs um, within the first few weeks of our operation. Absolutely. I think by year three, we'll go to about 500 direct jobs, yeah. uh, about 1,200 to 1,500 indirect jobs. Great. Um, 
Most of them are from Nakuru County. Mm -hmm. uh, the governor has been very supportive of the initiative, yeah. and uh, we want to contribute to the local community as much as we can. Um, on the listing question, mm -hmm. um, it's never off the cards. You know, nothing is off the cards for an entrepreneur. Sure. <laughs> uh, but when the right time comes, yeah. uh, when the right comes, the time comes, we would want um, larger public to participate mm -hmm. in this and um, become part of uh, of this venture Absolutely. and feel the ownership of it. Absolutely, because people would want to be part and parcel of your growth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Finally, five years from now, ten years from now, what are you seeing? Um, five years from now, I think. Many of the things that I have mentioned, yeah. I hope that other companies and other competitors become part of this journey. Yeah. That we are able to give a much better product, end product to the majority of the Kenyan consumers. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that we contribute to the government in you know, impacting policies, um, help communities build their skills, mm -hmm. um, contribute to the education mm -hmm. um, of, um, of the country mm -hmm. and develop leadership talent, not mid management uh, talent, not junior only. Those are important, very important too, yeah. but leadership talent as well. Um, and that we are operating in multiple countries of Africa, not just Kenya. Wow. Congratulations and we wish you all the best. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for your time. Lovely, <laughs> lovely talking to you, Maina. Excellent, Thank you. excellent. Faisal Farid, the CEO of Magzim Agri and Samak Grow, very optimistic that, listen, uh, we have just started and we are yet to show you what we got and we really wish them well, especially in just giving us quality and letting us as well mind our health. I live you now with the markets. See you next time.